I'm Amika. And I'm Jamie. And we're at the London Wetland Centre. And, and this, this is Wild, Wild and Seek. Seek. So we're here at the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust, London Wetlands Centre right here in Barnes. This is just one out of the nine centres in the whole of England. We're so close to London, you can even see the rain. And it's an extraordinary wildlife for us to seek out. The London Wetlands Centre has over 100 acres, which is home to some of the UK's top wildlife, including birds, frogs, newts, butterflies, bats, and even otters. There is so much for us to discover here. Should we find out what's coming up on the show today? Will will be discovering how to set up camera traps in order to capture the wildlife of animal expert Elliot. We're going to meet our young explorers in Kent who have been set a challenge on making a bug house. Pond dipping extraordinaire Paul is going to be telling Amika all about the creatures we can seek out in our local pond. And also throughout the show, Jamie and I are battling out to see who can spot the most birds from the Wetland Centre's six bird watching hideouts. While we got started on our bird seeking battle, earlier on in the week, Will caught up with animal expert Elliot and found out how secret cameras can help us uncover wildlife in our local nature reserves. Let's give it a check. Amika! Thanks, Jamie. Hi, I'm Will and I'm here in Tolworth to meet Elliot from the Environment Trust to help set up some camera traps. Now, it might look like we're in the countryside, but we're actually only a few miles from central London. So we've just come across something very exciting. What have we got here? Cool, so underneath these reptile mats we have here, I found a common toad. There's also some baby frogs under there as well. Is that a baby or is it fully grown? This is a baby, this is a young one. Yeah, very, very young. They can grow a lot bigger than this. Yeah. They're quite warty. Ooh, Ooh. There he goes, you all right, pal? There you go, I'll put him back, shall I? Let yeah. him enjoy the rest of his day. Let's go set up those camera traps. Oh, look at this. Ooh, what have we found here? Well, here, you can see it's where a badger has been sniffling around the ground and to look, because they've got a really good nose, and they sniffle around the ground to try and find food. And they sometimes leave marks where they've, been, where they've been putting their nose. So here, you can see there's a bit of moss which has been lifted up by the badger and you can see it's a sort of rough mark, a rough patch here. So that's clear evidence that we've got badgers walking around here. Brilliant. It looks like we're on the right track then. Let's go set up the camera. Let's do it. Right, so we're here in the forest. Now, Elliot was just saying that the badger sets are somewhere over there. But how do we decide where to set up the camera traps? So badgers are pretty la lazy. So what we have to look for is try and work with their paths on the ground where they were going to walk to try and forage to find their food. Yep. So here, we've got quite an easy pathway which they can go up and down. So I think this tree is ideal as it's right by the path and there's nothing in between. So anything that walks past here, we should get a video of. Right, I thought that badgers were nocturnal. So how can this camera uh, pick them up? Exactly, so badgers are nocturnal. That means they sleep, they, they sleep in the day typically and they come out at night and that's when they go and find their food. So luckily though, these cameras have an infrared light and they've like, got night vision on them. So they're really good uh, like image quality in, in, throughout the night, so it really is a good way to film them. Well, fingers crossed that we'll get some badgers, but is there any other wildlife that we might find in this area? Exactly, so there are deer tracks along here, so hopefully we might even get a roe deer, we'll definitely get foxes, and maybe a few tabby cats as well. Mm -hmm. Now, badgers live in homes known as sets. How many badgers would you expect to see in any set? Well, the largest sets can go up to like 15 badgers, which is really big, but the badger sets around here are probably a bit smaller. And what do badgers eat? So badgers, they're omnivores. That means they can eat both meat and bread, like vegetation. Um, but they're all, the main part of their diet is insects, things like worms and stuff like that, yeah. Wonderful, should we get this set up then? And Let's hopefully we'll be seeing some badgers. Cool, so I just need to set it to video mode because I can also take cameras. I know that this sort of camera trap is used by scientists. Now, why are they so useful in learning about uh, wildlife? So we use these to do surveys. So if we want to know how many badgers are living in an area, 
it's a lot easier to put a camera trap up than to sit around and try and see some badgers. So if we were looking, if we were standing here, it's most likely a badger wouldn't come because it would smell us and it would be a bit afraid of us. But by having just a camera here, it won't really smell the camera, so it will be able to come up here, do its normal thing, and it'll be able to get a nice video of it. And by knowing there's badgers here, that knows that means as conservationists, it means we're doing a good job because we're looking after the environment, making sure it's good enough for badgers and all sorts of things to live here. Right, this camera trap looks like it's set up nice and firm. Should we go set up our second one? Let's do it. Right, so we've set up our first camera trap, but I think the second one might be a little bit harder. I think I'll leave that one to you, Elliot. Wish me luck. Good luck. Right, I'm off to do some exploring, but find out later in the show to see if Elliot and I caught any badgers on film. Now, it's back to you at the Wildlife Centre. Yes, that was incredible. Fingers crossed that we catch a glimpse of a badger. <gasps> So here I am in one of the hides in the London Wetland Centre. And you're probably wondering why I'm whispering. But when you're in the hides, you have to be really quiet and try not to make too much noise. Otherwise, you'll scare away the birds. Oh, wow. Oh, quick. I've just spotted a Canadian goose. Incredible. You can tell it's Canadian goose because they have a long black neck and white cheeks and their body is brown. Hang on, Jamie, you better not be beating me. I'm in luck because I've just started my bird adventure and I have already found my very first bird and that is the mallard duck. It's probably the most commonly known duck as the female mallard makes that classic quacking sound. We've also got some male mallard ducks behind us who have the green heads and the yellow beaks where the female ducks have brown feathers with blue patterns on. Amika, how are you doing? So here I am at the London Wetland Centre and I'm about to go pond dipping. I'm joined by Paul, our learning manager here at the London's Wetland Centre, and he's given me this net to use as we will be pond dipping. Now, I don't know anything about pond dipping, so you're going to have to give us a little bit of an intro on what's going to go down today. Please let us know, pond dipping, Paul. OK, well, pond dipping is basically where you get a net and you try and catch animals that live inside the pond. OK. Very simple. And so we're going to be using these nets. Is there a certain way how to do it? I think you might have to give us an example. There is. So the scientific way of doing it is you place your net in the water. OK. And then you draw a number eight in the water, a figure of eight. OK. The most important thing is you're swishing your net around. Most of the animals are going to hide. They're going to make it hard for you. So you need to stick your net into the plants. And also scraping the sides is another really good place. Oh, to wow. Look. So you really have to go oh, quite yes. deep all around. And then bring your net out and to empty it, you just place it in the tray, turn it over and you can give it a little shake so it goes inside out. Et voila, all wow. my animals are now in the tray. And what are we hoping to discover here at the London Wetland Centre? Um, what, uh, what is in there? <laughs> there's a variety of animals that we could find. So in the tray at the moment, I've got a couple of small snails, a little diving beetle, Oh yeah, he's scurrying, yeah. A tiny little animal called a freshwater limpet. Mm -hmm. So normally you find limpets by the sea, but there are limpets that will live in ponds. Okay. With newts, you might find tadpoles. So there's all sorts of things that might come out of the water. How do they help our wildlife? Why are they important to what's your environment? So particularly things like the fly larvae and the fly nymphs, they'll become insects and they'll be flying around and they become food for some of our visiting birds okay. and some of our bats as well. They love to eat things like the midges uh, and those sorts of things. Wow, so, well, Paul, thank you so much for chatting with me. And um, yeah, I think I'm going to be going home and making my own pond. Good luck. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to go and wash my hands now. So I think it's time to take it to Kent to meet our young explorers who's going to show us how to make their very own bug house. Hi, I'm Felix. Hi, I'm Freddie. And, and this, this is, is Sam. Sam. And today we're going to be building a bug hotel.
Thank you so much, Felix and Freddie. That looked amazing. Now, if you want to make your very own Wild and Seek bug house, go to our website, www.wildandseek.co.uk, and all the instructions are on there. Now, look at this room. It is full of games, and this one here is my absolute favorite. It demonstrates how the reeds filter out any waste or nasties from the water. Take, for instance, this ball. This represents the waste. It is then broken down into harmless chemicals, which are actually really good for the roots. Earlier on in the program, Will caught up with animal expert Elliot and he laid some camera traps. So let's check out what he caught on camera. Hello Elliot, I hear you have some exciting news for me. We do indeed, so the camera traps were a great success. We had two camera traps out in the wood as you know, and we got some great footage. Uh, this one here is of a badger. You can see this badger walking down here. Oh, lovely. Doing his badgery thing. You can see he stops occasionally to mark scent and he's ruffling through the, through the ground. What do you mean by mark scent? Well, so badgers are quite territorial. So what they do, they have to mark scent in various places to say, this is my home, other badgers, this is where I live, don't, don't mess with me. And it's a good like, code to let badgers know that they're, they're present in the area. Very exciting. And did you get any other uh, videos for us to have a look at? We've got some great footage of a fox um, on multiple occasions, a fox cleaning himself and foxes walking through. It looks like we have a lovely, young, healthy fox there. What exactly would you call a baby fox? Yes, this is great. This is a, a young fox cub. So we call baby foxes cubs. And it's just sitting here, enjoying the sunshine, giving himself a bit of a scratch. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed you see quite a lot of foxes in the city. Um, is it common to see them uh, more in urban areas or in the countryside? Yeah, that's a really good question. So in our cities, we had, tend to have lots and lots of foxes, mainly because there's lots of rubbish that they can eat. If you go out into the countryside, there's not as many foxes, they're harder to see. So towns are really good places to see foxes. Now there's a lot of roads uh, in the city. Is, is that dangerous for foxes? And if so, if you see an injured fox, for example, um, how can you help? Mm. Well, roads are dangerous for everyone or anything. So if a fox gets hit by a car, it can obviously be really, really badly damaged. So if you ever see an injured fox, best thing to do is Google the nearest rescue centre and uh, get in touch with them and let the professionals come and help him and make sure he gets back to full health. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, and I understand we've got some footage of a tawny owl, which is very exciting. He's hiding away in the corner of the screen and he flo floats away. We've got lots of birds and we've even got a roe deer. Now you've got quite a few videos of badgers here. Uh, do we think it's the same one over and over again or is it likely to be different badgers? Yes, yeah, so the badgers they all look very similar, don't they? So it's quite difficult to tell them apart. So you have to look at little things that might give you a clue to say this is a different badger from the other one. Yeah. So here we've got two badgers, I think, because their tails are slightly different. One has a quite fluffy tail mm -hmm. and one has a not so fluffy tail. So that makes me think we've got two badgers. So if any of the young viewers out there would like to get involved and help their local wildlife, how might they go about doing that? Oh, there's lots of ways to do it. You can go into your own garden to make them more friendly for wildlife. We can come out and volunteer with organisations like the Environment Trust. So just Google conservation organisations that are local and there's lots of ways you can go out on your weekends and make uh, your spaces better for wildlife and the local communities that live there too. Very exciting. <laughs> well, I'm just completely <laughs> astonished at the amount of footage that we got of wildlife in the area. And I guess that just goes to show that it doesn't matter where you are, there's always exciting wildlife to see. Now, if you'd like to take a closer look at the videos that we've captured today, please do have a look at our website. Well, thank you very much, Elliot, for all your help. Thank you. Now, join us again next week, where I'll be seeking out lots of exciting new wildlife hiding in your area. I can't believe that Will managed to catch some wild animals on camera. That is incredible. Thank you so much to Elliot for all your help. Now, I think we should be close to revealing the results from me and Jamie's bird spotting competition. I thought I'd give Jamie a few extra minutes to earn some points and make the competition a little bit more fair, right? While he does that, I'm going to be telling you guys about a very cute creature that lives in the wild. Meet the otters. These are the Asian short clawed otters. The Asian otters can weigh up to six kilograms and also grow up to 90 centimeters. The Asian short clawed otter is the smallest otter in the world, but the biggest otter can grow up to six foot long. Otters have thick wood repellent hair that covers their bodies so they don't get cold. Under their hair, they have a lot of muscle and also a very big flat tail, which is extremely powerful. Their tail helps them from falling over and it also helps them swim in the water. 
Otters have a flat tail to help them turn quickly in the water and escape from predators. Otters can hold their breath for up to four minutes under the water. And I can only hold my breath for what, 15 seconds? <laughs> Otters use all four of their feet to swim and they also doggy paddle, just like we do when we're first learning how to swim. Otters communicate with each other through sound. So if you ever hear a high-pitched squeak by the river, you've probably found yourself an otter. But these otters are in danger due to an increase of pollution in their rivers and lakes. And this is because us humans are releasing harmful chemicals in the water. But groups such as the London Wetland Centre are here to help. They're spreading the word on teaching us all about otters and what we can do to save them. Yes, I agree. Otters are so cute. And did you know that sea otters hold hands while they are sleeping so they do not drift apart? Now that is family values. I just can't believe that the biggest otter can grow up to six foot long. That's actually kind of scary. <laughs> right, guys, so I think that it's time to reveal the winners for my little competition. Uh, who is ready to find out the results? Um, I am, but are you ready to lose? No way, I'm not losing. So before we reveal the winners, I think that we should look back and see how we got on. We've just had a lovely sighting of a red robin. You can tell it's a red robin bird because it has a red coloured breast and also a brown body. Now you can see red robins all year round, but we especially see them at Christmas. That's my favourite time of year. So behind me we have the white naped crane. They have red patches around their eyes and long pink legs. Sadly, they are losing their wetlands in China, Korea and Mongolia because of farming and the ever-growing demand of water. But that is why the London Wetland Centre is so important. Not only is it keeping the birds safe, it's educating the public as well. So come with me as we find some more birds. Very exciting news. We've just spotted a moorhen. Just like the one we saw in the photo. You can tell it's a moorhen because it has a really big red beak. You can see a moorhen all year round. Can't wait to see what other, other birds we find. We have just found a black-headed gull, and despite its name, its head is actually chocolate brown. It has red legs and a red beak, and it makes a really angry grrr sound. So that's another one ticked off my Wild and Seek checklist. Don't forget to go online and print yours off as well. I've just spotted a swan. I bet you guys have seen one of those before, right? But did you guys know that swans can actually fly? And they can also fly up to 60 miles per hour. That is super fast. <laughs> Jamie, you had better not be cheating. Speaking of, where are you? I'm not cheating, but I do hope you're having as much fun as I am, Amika, because I've already seen a mala duck and a coot, and I'm on the hunt for more. And we are in luck, because there is my favourite, the tuft duck. The tuft duck has a little tuft at the back of its head, it has white and black feathers, and it is known as the diving duck. I can't believe you found a crane! That is incredible! Although I did find a little red robin bird and there's no bird cuter than that. My crane had massive long pink legs and towers over your robin. Much cooler. But my robin comes out at Christmas. The best time ever. <laughs> right, our competition is now over and I think it's time to reveal the winner, right? Can we have a drum roll please? It's okay, Amika. <laughs> if you want to see some of that amazing wildlife that me and Amika have seen, come down to your local garden centre, your park, even mm -hmm. the wetland centre, because there may be some wonderful wildlife waiting for you. It can take all day though, so don't worry. Grab some water and just have a good time. And if you would like to print off your own Wild and Seek bird checklist, you can do so from our website, www.wildandseek.co.uk. All of today's information can be found on there, plus more. I can't believe we're at the end of today's show. Amika, what's been your favourite moment here at the Wetland Centre? Hmm. You know what, I did love pond dipping. It was so cool, you could find so many things there. <laughs> what about you? Oh, for me, it has to be the games room. You can be a big, big kid in there. <laughs>
absolutely love it. Right, guys, I want to say a big thank you to everyone involved in Wild and Seek, everyone who watched Wild and Seek, and a special thank you to WWT London Wetland Centre for letting us have such an amazing day here, right? <laughs> the best day. Me and Amika have found so much wildlife here, so don't forget to tune in next week. We'll be somewhere else in the country <laughs> seeing what wildlife they have. So bye from me. Bye from me.